Hello everybody, hi. Uh, it's Public Life and it's Friday the 26th. I'm a little excited because even though I like doing this, I'm looking forward to going to the studio because we're kind of counting down. I think we have maybe like three or four more lives to do. And then as they say in the market, after today no more, after today and see no more. Let's see who I'm who. Um, uh, Rosita Griffin, King Woman, the Wando. Oh, I know the Wando, the most beautiful the Wando. Uh, Wale Bank here, and so on and so forth. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining the live. My name is Fumi, as you know, and this is Public Eye Live. My guests today, you also know very well because they are, some, they are cultural and um, they are cultural icons in Nigeria. And I'm pleased that they've agreed to join us on today's live. We're going to start the conversation this morning. I mean, it's not morning. I've spent so many years in the morning, I keep still revert to the morning. This evening, um, with Ndidi Oneli Okonkwo. Hi, Ndidi. Hi, Fumi, long time. Hello, hello, hello. hello. hello Great hello, to hello. reconnect hello. with you. I've missed you. <laughs> Great to reconnect with you. I haven't seen you in such a long time. I know, it's been a really long time. Great, you look fabulous. So do you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Anyway, I mean, I, I hadn't finished telling everybody else who else would be because I got excited talking about you. But also for those joining us, later on in the day, we are going to be talking with Lisa Falawio because we're also going to be business of fashion. And at the end of the day, people don't think about media as business, but it is business. And we'll be talking with Chief Dele Momodu, who has kind of traversed the sphere for 30 odd years. But I want to start with Ndidi. And I will start by actually reading out you know, a bit of what people should know about you. Because the thing is, I feel like everybody knows you and what you do. But we are talking to people across the world. So it's important to know who it is that we're talking to. Uh, Ndidi Oneli uh, Okonkwo is a managing partner at Sahel Consultancy and also co-founder. Um, what uh, Sahel does is agriculture and nutrition, you know, just across West Africa and the policy ventures and solutions. She's also co-founder at Ace Foods, which I didn't know recently, and I've been using Ace, you know, and they manufacture a lot of the packaged foods and spices on the ship in Nigeria. Um, finally, she also serves on the boards of Rockefeller Foundation, Nigerian Bureau's PLC, and so on and so forth, including Business Day. She's founder of Leap Africa, which is what a lot of people remember. She's also the author of Social Innovation in Africa, a practical guide for scaling impact. What you might not know so well is also that she developed a nutritional supplement food, which was donated to IDPs in Nigeria, especially to boost you know, uh, nutrition and care for people in IDP camps. She also co-founded the Center for Memories, a space to remember the civil war and culture and art in Enugu. What don't you do? <laughs> I'm trying to be like you, Fumi. <laughs> trying to be like you. I'm, I'm hoping that one day you will run for president in Nigeria. Oh, after you. <laughs> Some of us desire to make an impact outside politics. I know you're just trying. You're, you're, because you're being polite in front of other people, you don't want to drag me. But I'm just leave the matter for, for now. What I wanted to ask to start with is, what, what, with COVID, what was your first thought when you heard about the scale of the problem? You didn't realize that food is medicine and that food is such a critical component of any health system. And when we were thinking about the number of ventilators and hospitals, we weren't thinking about farmers and ensuring that there's food made available to people to make sure that their bodies are strong, but also to prevent them from falling ill. Uh, so actually early on, and got very involved in ensuring that as we are writing lockdown policies, that we're also ensuring that farmers are considered as workers and food processors and, and chefs are considered essential workers. Because honestly, they were being written out of every single policy document that was flying around. And so I was busy trying to ensure that we didn't do that. And thankfully, uh, it's elevated the status of food and the importance of the agriculture ecosystem uh, because so many people have been affected. Um, in just the last few weeks, Fumi, prices have risen across Nigeria. For Gary, 
you know, I'm, you can say, oh, imported prices will increase trust because me, of I oil stocks and the devaluation. Trust, trust, trust me, trust me, I know. I know. <laughs> and for the first time in my 20 years in this country, I got calls from carpenters and painters, hardworking men who would say, please give me money to feed my family. People who were proud and never would have asked for money were asking for money. Um, and that just shocked me. It yeah. really shocked me. So it shows us how integral our food is to health. Yeah. I mean, on the surface of it, this particular government had, had um, anchored sort of like the economic plan around agriculture. And one would have thought that we would have been better prepared in that area, given the amount of um, work and interest that has seemed to go into agriculture in the past five years or thereabouts. What, 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 was it just the scale was too much, or maybe it's not exactly what it was said to have been? For me, we've been stuck in the 1970s and 80s when it comes to agriculture in Nigeria. You still hear pronouncements like, we're buying 10,000 tractors to give farmers. We're giving seeds and fertilizer to farmers. And that's not what agriculture is in the 21st century. It's a business, and it's from farm to fork. And private sector should be driving the sector. And actually, government should just be creating an enabling environment for all of us to thrive. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of the silos, for example, and the food reserves that we said we had, um, a lot of that food was spoiled. A lot of it was not well preserved. So there's, there's, you know, I don't want to get into government policy and the state of affairs, but I'll just say that it's like the same thing we've done in education and in healthcare. We've been behind the eighth ball instead of being ahead. And we've been stuck in the 20th century instead of in the 21st century. And ultimately, a government has to just create an enabling environment. Nigerians are entrepreneurial. Nigerians will seize the day and create value where they can make money. But they just need to be supported. So more and more, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing for government to get out of the way and not do the work, because that's what they try to do in every single sector, to run, to run the interventions instead of leaving others to run them. So we really have not been ready. Our food ecosystems are really fragile. Our, our value chains are not competitive. And uh, relative to other parts of the world, we are really still net importers of food and still highly dependent on the rest of the world to feed us when we should be feeding ourselves on the rest of the world. I mean, recently, yeah. because I was watching one of, the, uh, one of the conversations you did once, and when you were mentioning some of the foods that were still importing, I was a little taken aback because I thought that those ones were taken care of. I was also taken aback yep. to find out how much wastage was still happening because I remember about 10 years ago doing a series around Nigeria and talking to farmers and I still hear the farmer's voice in my ears because they say to me, I tell me, you know, take the pineapple now before it gets to Lagos, don't spoil. You know, that sort of thing that we just can't yeah, move it yeah. in good enough time. We can't store it. So we're still talking about yeah. the same thing now. It's a little worrisome. But then yeah. a pandemic like this um, is an opportunity to reset ordinarily because yeah. everyone is in such shock. Some of the things in other economies of the world, in fact, around the world, some of the theories and ideas that before now everybody was, would say was a little crazy have become inevitable. Why has that not happened for Nigeria? It seems like we are not shocked enough to do what we need to do. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I think actually COVID is a gift. Because number one, other countries are closing their borders to the exportation of food. The United States is experiencing severe food issues as well because the ecosystem is broken. A lot of the farmers were selling to restaurants. Now restaurants are not buying. Food services are not buying. So food prices are rising all over the world. The challenge now is if other borders, countries are closing their borders, can we look inward? And so we're seeing, like Ace Foods is seeing an upsurge in demand for companies that would not talk to us before uh, for their spice and seasoning needs. Now they're talking to us um, because they realize, gosh, you know, we really have to source locally. And the devaluation is also creating a whole demand around food because historically people were looking for um, these items abroad because it was cheaper for them or more expedient for them to import. And now they're having to source locally because a currency is devalued. So I, I see this as a gift. I see it as an opportunity to reimagine, to rebuild, to collaborate across sectors, um, for the private sector to work together. 
Um, and I'm seeing a lot of people uh, who ordinarily would not come together and work together, working together, which is exciting. Right. I mean, that's interesting to know mm -hmm. that prior to this, people preferred perhaps, I mean, they preferred to get spices and things that they could have got from Ace Foods in the first instance, you know, for no other I'm reason. Broad. Yeah. Yeah. That it was that it was cheap. That didn't make sense to me because that, uh, uh, this conversation about a grid for me also includes nutrition. And oftentimes, mm -hmm. talking about the break in you know agriculture and other parts of the world, there's also the big conversation about the quality of food in those parts of the yes. world. And yes, what it does to the human body, particularly at a time like yeah. when health is in focus. You know, speak to us therefore about you know the confluence between nutrition and actually farming in your own environment. Yes. What difference it makes. Yeah. Yes. So what's really shocking for me is that historically, Nigerians and Africans have viewed our food as inferior, which is shocking, right? They believe that if something is bought in the UK or in India or in China and brought into Nigeria, it's better quality. And they don't believe that our standards are high here. But they don't realize that Africa is often considered the sink of the world. There's a lot of dumping of substandard food on our continent. And because it's perceived and branded as foreign, it's, it's not better. In fact, longer value chains means that food is unhealthier because oftentimes it's gone through 20 countries and 30 different companies before it gets to you. Now, if you have a short supply chain and you can actually have traceability to the farmer, which we do at Ace Foods, we, we have the name of the farmer on the bag of most of the products we buy, that allows us to say Alahaji in this uh, LGA in Kaduna State you know, this ginger is from him. That traceability is so powerful. The potency of the product is powerful. Yes, we need higher standards in Nigeria. We need to protect our consumers. We need SON and NAVDAC to police bad behavior. But that has to also occur in the countries where we're importing from. And whenever I'm abroad, I say to people, yes, you reject our beans because you say that it has insecticide. Meanwhile, you're sending us things that our people should not be consuming. You're sending us something that's called milk that has no animal protein. It shouldn't be called milk. You're mm -hmm. sending us flour that has, you know, anyway, don't get me into food fraud because that's a big issue that I have. So for me, I think it's a two-way street. Ultimately, for me, consumers need to be empowered to make yes. decisions about the food we consume. Every mm -hmm. consumer listening has to look at labels, has to ask the tough questions has to follow their food because we have to protect our families. The rates of cancer rising in Africa at alarming rates. And majority of this is linked to some of the food that we consume. And so we really have to change our habits. That said, we need a lot more local processing. Right now, for example, there's corn in abundance because it's, it's, it's the season, right? And we're eating roasted corn and ube and mango just ended. But why should we have seasonality? Why can't we have, you know, uh, dried or canned or pureed all year round. Um, and that's the challenge for us. And that's one of the reasons we started Ace Foods, because we believe that we should be able to have access to these same great food all year round. Right. And the exciting thing is that Nigerians are finally starting to embrace the proudly Nigerian um, model. And it's been tough. Convincing people that you know it's high quality. If you open my spice cabinet, all you find is Ace Food spices. I don't use anything else, and I use my own products. So if we're going to kill anybody for it, it's my family, my whole extended yeah. family, and everybody in my network. Yeah. And so the truth is, we have to make products we're proud of that we can consume, that can compete globally, and we have to raise the standards across the board. So talking about meeting that value change from end to end. What really needs to happen and what should be, you know, because I, sometimes I wonder what the disconnect is with government. You know, you, you see the intention, you can see sometimes that the intention is really good, but then that bit about handing up, you know, just stepping back and doing just the policy or the regulatory beats, it doesn't seem to connect. And this is across board in sectors, but with agriculture in particular, what will, what will end to end look like? And what ideally should governments be doing now, especially now that we have not only the impetus, but the reason, the, 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 the dire need to do it. So I'll use a, a, a classic example, which is dairy. And I do a lot of work in dairy. So I'm going to use, give you a real life example. So Nigerians import 97% of the processed milk we consume in this country, even though we have the fourth largest cattle herd in Africa. And so the truth is, 
there's no reason why we should be importing milk when we have all these cattle. So what is required? So for the last three years, doesn't even have the security back end because some of the terror, some of the issues, definitely, you know, some of the definitely conflicts are linked back to you know farming and dairy Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that's what for the last three years we worked on something called the Nigeria Dairy Development Project, and now we're working on the Advancing Local Dairy Development in Nigeria project, funded by the Gates Foundation. So what are we doing? And I'll walk you through it so you understand what needs to change. We basically said let's start from the demand. So we found we started with fifty companies that use milk in Nigeria. We found six that were really serious about local sourcing. Right. So we said. Can you commit that you're going to buy local milk? They said yes. Okay. So we've come in, we've put the nomadic communities into clusters to register them. Because that's the first problem is that our farmers are not registered, our farmers are not in clusters. So we've had to create this clustering system. Then we've trained the farmers. We've created a whole extension system because again, that's the second piece. Our extension workers are completely in the 19th century. We've equipped them with cell phones. So they can act, interact with these farmers on a daily basis. We're giving each of these communities milk cans so that they're not carrying the milk in uh, plastic cans. And then we're saying that they, they, they don't meet the standards of uh, no microbial uh, sanitation, hygiene. We're training the farmers on hygienic milk practices so that they're actually uh, milking their cows in a very efficient way. And then we're creating solar-powered po boreholes in these communities so that they have water now, these communities can now every day carry the milk to the milk processor, and the milk processor can process the milk into che uh, cheese, into yogurt, even to French fresh milk. And then you, as Fumi, can instead of buying dried milk, people say Nigerians love dried milk. Are you kidding? We don't know what is in that thing that we mix. Um, so you can have fresh yogurt or fresh cheese or ice cream that's rich, that's uh, healthy, and that's nutritious. Now, what is that doing? Number one, the nomadic communities uh, will be settled. They will have income, so they don't have to travel up and down. They'll have feed for their cattle. And we're creating a whole feed and fodder industry where they can buy feed. They don't have to go into my farm to eat my maize, right? The feed is right there. And then we're creating a whole vet system so that they have care and their cows have care and their productivity rises from one to two liters to five liters or six liters. And then we can start displacing imports. Now, this project worked for three years in Oyo State and Kanu State, and now we're doing it in Jigawa, Adamawa, Kaduna, Kanu, and Plateau State, in partnership with private companies like IDL, Farm Fresh, LNZ, um, Majestic, and uh, Sebore, companies that are really committed to local sourcing. And what do we need the government to do? The government is coming along, setting up policies so that guess what? We don't make it more expensive for these local processors and cheaper for people to bring in milk. Mm -hmm. So the government is partnering with us. CBN is partnering with us to make sure that the policy environment is right and to protect these companies and to protect these, um, these feed and fodder um, uh, farms and to ensure that there's a cohesive policy environment. Because if one ministry supports it and another ministry reduces the tariffs for importation, you completely destroy everything that I've worked for. So we're basically going to be touching 60,000 uh, uh, farms, farmers, 120,000 families. Imagine the impact. Now, it's catalytic. Guess what? Because this has started working, people are calling us saying, can I be join this effort? Um, companies that s sell ice cream in Lagos are saying, can you introduce us to these companies so we can buy milk from them? And you start creating a whole ecosystem. And that's my dream. My dream is that every morning my children can drink milk and it will be affordable. Because right now, the, the milk that we source from some of these companies, over a thousand naira, it's too expensive for the average, for one liter, it's too expensive for the average family. So this is an example and it's a real life project that we're working on. It's tough, but it's doable. And when you have a whole ecosystem working together, it becomes just an exciting thing to behold because you know that we can compete. Why should farmers in the Netherlands and New Zealand and uh, Denmark be benefiting from Nigeria when our farmers are struggling? And that's what we're trying to change. I mean, that sounds amazing. I knew that if I, if I heard it from you, then it becomes clearer because I'd already heard quite a bit of the work that you were doing. What I'm concerned about is 
you know, making sure that this, because you've already alluded to it, but I wanted to be clear how much of this takes the, what we call the subsistence farmer, the, the poorest farmer along, because a lot of things sometimes that we do, I mean, it benefits the middle class who can afford to, you know, I mean, maybe start a business at a certain level. But there are people who are already in those communities who are farmers traditionally working in the fields. How do we, how much of this takes them along? And this is still an initiative that's private, I know. But the yeah. skill, how do we achieve skill that's completely trans transformative in a very short period of time? Yeah, so the first question in terms of the farmers, definitely this is taking along the, the lowest income farmers. So the nomadic communities, whom if you go into these communities, they have cows, but they, these cows are like assets. So 95% illiteracy rate, right? Completely cut off from any digital uh, uh, financial literacy, um, completely cut off from the, the rest of the ecosystem. And so we're working with them. And women are empowered because in, in the nomadic communities, especially the Fulanese, women own the cows. Women own the milk, men own the cows. So there's a gender component to this as well, which is fantastic. And, and then in terms of what, how this can be scaled, at the end of the day, we need every single private company that's using milk in Nigeria to start sourcing locally. And the only way to change this is by showing that it can be done profitably. If you can show that it can be done profitably, you will attract all sorts of people to the sector. Right. And so we have a, a weekly newsletter we produce. We celebrated World Milk Day. We're totally trying to make milk and dairy sexy and to show that there's profits. And if you can do that, Nigerians will jump into, the, in, into it. And if there's an enabling environment that makes sure that it's sustainable, they'll continue to engage. So that's literally what we're working on. And trust me, it's back-breaking work. It's very difficult. I have a whole team in Abuja and in each of these states working day and night. Even during the COVID era, we had to make masks for all our farmers. But we're doing it in the 21st century, meaning we have every extension worker has a phone. Every day I'm getting data on how much milk is being collected, uh, how many farmers are being trained. And that data is allowing us to adjust and shape policy on a regular basis. I mean, one of the things I'd like to be clear to those watching and on this conversation is, I don't think enough is said about how important it is to eat locally in terms of health care. Yeah. So it's, it's crucial. Our bodies are adapted to, the, to our environment. And the global mm -hmm. food chain itself is very problem, problematic. We actually, by working like this, I don't know how much of what you're doing now takes into cognizance and is avoiding the, pit, you know, the, the, the pitfalls that other economies are falling into in terms of the kind of food that then becomes problematic for the human being down the line. So I'm talking as yeah. food things like GMOs, Obesity. Of food, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and all of that. Yeah. At this, we, since we are starting at this point, isn't this a great opportunity to actually do what will be ethical, what will be healthier, and what will be sustainable on the long run? Definitely. I mean, I want African food to be celebrated globally. And Fumi, I would love to ask for your help. You know, one of the things I've realized is that, honestly, the way we used to eat food, our traditional food, is extremely healthy. You know, the vegetables, the fruits, the, the way we prepared food traditionally was extremely healthy. Um, and now we've adopted this whole concept of pizza and hamburgers and fries being cool. Even noodles, with all due respect, this instant noodles. This is stuff is destructive, right? And so what we need to do is to make African food number one. Now, I've been looking at how the Japanese did it. And I think media has a very important role to play. Whenever I go to Europe, I ask the audience, How many, what's your favorite African dish? Nobody can mention anything. I say, okay, Nigerian, Ethiopian, they don't know. What's your favorite Japanese or Thai dish? Hundreds of answers. That didn't happen by chance. These countries had a sustained, systematic campaign to elevate their food. And I think we need to do it within our continent, but we also need to do it globally. Historically, when you look at rankings of food, African food is always ranked the last because mm -hmm. people are just ignorant about the food. So yeah. one of the things we've started is a website called nourishingafrica.com. It's a new business that we've just launched. It's a hub envisaged as a hub for a million entrepreneurs to help entrepreneurs in the food and agriculture landscape scale. And we have a corner called African food, food culture, 
where we're celebrating African food and raising awareness. And let me tell you, the more I learn about our food, the more excited I am. Our food is, you know, teff, this Ethiopian food, or even in, in Nigeria, we call it acha. Mm -hmm. it, it's um, gluten-free. It's, it's, it's better than quinoa. And we don't know it. You know, it's healthy, it has protein. These are indigenous foods. Or you talk about okwa. Okwa, is, is, the Igbos love okwa. That is highly, I mean, the protein content in okwa rivals any meat product. And we don't even celebrate it. Or our beans, or our cowpea. You know, the Yorubas love beans. Meanwhile, we have 60% malnutrition in the North. They don't eat the beans that they produce. So we need to change our mindsets in our country, promote broad-based awareness, um, really address this issue because obesity is rising in Africa, um, heart disease and all the um, ramifications of that. Um, and COVID-19, if you do have a propensity for obesity or diabetes, you're uh, susceptible. So there's definitely a need for us to go back to our indigenous food, celebrate our indigenous food, elevate the status of African food and all become champions of this movement. So Ndidi, you are speaking to the right person. So people ask me all the time, they say, you know, I mean, how come you're slim? How come I don't eat anything but Nigerian food? I can say this. Fantastic. Fantastic. I actually understand also the science and also the technique and the art behind a lot of the foods that are from Fantastic. The in Nigeria. And the other thing I will tell you when I see you is that I've had health challenges that I've only recovered from because of nutrition and nutrition of this soil. So we Fantastic. Have to, work to, to do. And, you know, I'm passionate about that in particular because I really see even the big global conversation about blackness being related to thickness. I say to people, mm. you go to villages, you don't see obese black people. No, you don't. You don't. So that you begin to see that in, in many, many parts of the world speaks about something much more important that we should have a separate conversation about some other time. So, I mean, you are Thank speaking you. to a person in that regard. I love it. So, I love it. I've got a question here. Someone is saying, how do individual families in Lagos access fresh milk? So right now, some of our, custom, uh, some of our companies like LNZ and IDL do send milk every day to Lagos. Mm -hmm. um, we are also going to be working with a few companies in Oyo and Ogun State to do the same thing. So watch this space. But for now, I'll suggest LNZ and IDL, Farm Fresh. Those are two very reliable Companies that do source locally. Right. So, Ndidi, what do you do for fun? <laughs> I mean, me right now, what? right now, I don't have a lot of fun. I, I actually tell. work I around tell. the clock. <laughs> I'm stressed. That's not okay. That's not okay. I'm really, but really stressed. But my children. What's going for me right now, right now, the problems in our country are quite immense. Yeah. And there's no time. Um, I'm writing a book called Food Entrepreneurs in Africa, Scaling Resilient Agriculture Businesses, which will be published this year. And yeah. this is one of the things that's keeping me up at night because we need to feed ourselves and feed the world. I, I get really upset that we're so, that the rest of the world makes money off us and that people think agriculture is a poor man's job and that it's not a good use of our time. So I want to totally change mindsets in this. And I've been working on this for 12 years, this uh, whole sector. And we're just beginning. We're just starting. So I don't have a lot of a balanced life right now, but I think it's just the phase. And uh, hopefully in a, a, a few months, I'll be able to go back to normal. But COVID-19 is also keeping us really busy, my dear, because we need to make sure our people are fed. If they're, and if they're hungry, you know what will happen. Social unrest, rising crime rate. So we really have to take this thing seriously um, and ensure that we innovate and um, rebuild and retool. Right. So eventually, I'm also hoping if you're not going to run for president, at least you'll become agriculture minister. <laughs> I want to work with you on the food, food culture and, yeah, and yeah, uh, the, food, the food mandate. Let, let's focus on that. Let other people worry about politics. You see that the politics in our country right now is not a conducive environment for either one of us uh, mm -hmm. because we're too honest and uh, uh, we're very focused on impact, not on pleasing people. So <laughs> I didn't say they always say I'm the trouble someone. I didn't say it in the presidential world. You said it. All right. I Mr. said it. I said it. All right. My Thank dear. you so much. Very Great talking with you. I'll be in touch. All right. I'm well done. Very proud of you. Well done. Thank you. God bless. All right. Bye. <laughs>